Okie dokie. Well, we want to welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us at the webinar today. Today's webinar is part two of our conceptual design webinar um, that we hosted uh, about four weeks ago now. Um, you can, if you registered for that webinar and did not attend it, you have been sent an email that does house the recording of that webinar. So please make sure you check your email. Uh, and any of the emails that we send for registering for any of the webinars, you can sign up to be on the email list to receive all the previous recorded webinars. Um, so you can keep track and keep up and keep learning. Uh, so today, like I said, is part two of the best SketchUp alternative conceptual design. And um, we kind of did this one because Gabriel noticed that the SketchUp license was changing and a lot of people were pretty upset about that. So we decided to say, hey, okay, let's show people how we can do conceptual design in Revit and it's pretty easy. So with that, I will hand everything over to Gabrielle and we will begin. Great, sounds good. Thank you so much, Mara. Uh, like Mara said, we are really happy to be presenting this as an alternative to SketchUp. If you are considering making that jump over to their uh, subscription model for licensing after having the perpetual model for a while, uh, we really feel your pain and really wanted to offer some kind of an alternative that would save you on that subscription cost, especially as we're in this strange pandemic year. So hopefully um, by switching over to Revit for conceptual design, you'll find that it is a great way to model concepts and then get into DDs and CDs, permit plans, everything a whole lot quicker. Uh, so with that being said, my name is Gabrielle Bovard. I'm the director of Cadnetics U. Um, Cadnetics U is really something that we created as the Cadnetics company. We've been in the uh, BIM and CAD space for 27 years now. Uh, we provide support services to engineers and architects and building owners. You name it, we basically do it for those industries. We are really heavily involved with software. So uh, as the years went on, we were getting a lot of requests to help with training, and we started Cadnetics U to address that. So now here we are, we're in 2020, it's a strange year, and we're doing our part to just make sure that everyone's using their software as efficiently as possible and getting the most out of their budgets. Uh, so that being said, we are ready to dive into part two of this conceptual design um, through Revit rather than SketchUp. So, let me share my Revit screen and we will get started. All right, so this might look a little familiar if you were with us for part one. If you weren't, then uh, feel free to join in at any time uh, by going back and watching that replay. And so here, this is the Revit's conceptual mass environment. And I promised last time that there would be a Halloween treat I delivered on that. As you can see, there's a jack-o'-lantern on top of my building. It's there for a good reason. I'm gonna show you some really cool tools that we can uh, use with this building, with this jack-o'-lantern to flesh out basically any concept you could ever think to create inside Revit or for a building project that you're working on. Uh, so here we are, we're still in this conceptual mass environment. Like I said, if you missed the first part, you might wanna go back and see that, but you'll see what, um, what we learned were how to work with these reference planes here, how to use model lines and reference lines to create a variety of different shapes, whether you wanna create a jack-o'-lantern, a building extrusion, spheres, lofts, sweeps, anything under the sun that you could possibly use for your uh, building concept, you can create here within Revit and we showed you how. Uh, we also looked at how to constrain models to planes if you're worried about lot lines and things like that. And we looked at um, how to create levels within the project or within the family. And so that's where I'm gonna start right now because if you were here last time, you remember you can create these levels inside the Revit conceptual mass family, but they won't necessarily go with us when we go into a Revit project. So let's go over to our elevation view quickly. And you might wanna screenshot this or take note of it somehow because we wanna recreate these levels exactly as they are once we get into the Revit project. Now I made it easy on myself. I have level one through 10 here, they're all 15 feet apart. So I'm just gonna create a mental note and you might wanna hang on to that too and um, keep that in mind for when we go to the Revit project. And one other thing I wanna do before we get into the Revit project 
is to prepare this model here for being inserted. And the first thing to do here is to uncheck work plane base in our properties. And the reason I'm doing that is because I want to be able to place this model wherever I want it inside of my Revit project. And I don't wanna to have to assign a work plane just to do that. So now that I've uh, created some of my levels, I remember where they are and I unchecked work plane base, let's go ahead and load this into a project. So first thing, I don't have a project open, so I'm going to create a file new project here. Show you how to do that. For some reason, I'm getting a little lag. There we go. File new project. And you've got these template options. I'm going to go ahead and choose an architectural template. Um, actually, I'll just pop it down that way and create a new project from that. So hit OK. And then once that loads, the first thing I'm going to do, like I said, we don't have the right levels in this project yet. So I'm going to open an elevation view and I'm going to change these default levels. Like I said, mine, I have 15 feet apart, so I've changed that. Now I can use copy here. I'm going to copy multiple. I'm just going to drag this up. Level three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. So now I've got my levels exactly as I wanted them. And I am going back. So right now I'm still in that Revit project. I wanna go back to the family file. And I keep calling this a family file because Revit's conceptual masses are families. They are .rfa, if you can see here at the top of the screen. And so they are treated like a family file. And while I'm in here, I can load this into my project using the ribbon button and hit close here because I Revit is going to tell me that it's going to show the mass and that's what I want. I'm going to hit close. And since this is um, being loaded in as a family, it's going to show up here as a component family and I can click and place it. And like a, like a regular component, I can place as many as I need, but for this, I just need one. Now, another thing to keep in mind, I can see it here because that Notification told me that Revit was turning on the show mass mode, but if I go to the 3D view of my project, it might or might not show up. The way to solve this is to go to your visibility graphic overrides here in the properties and hit edit and scroll down to mass and enable that. Make sure it's checked because if Revit's show mass mode did not turn on, you're not going to see this. And I would do that for every view that you'd like to see it. So if we wanna have it show up in an elevation, we'll do that too. Like I said though, I turned on the show mass mode so it's gonna see um, the mass and all the views that I might need to work with. So going back to 3D here, uh, what are some of the things that we're noticing? So first of all, this building, Halloween appropriate, is sort of a ghost. We can see right through it. And that's because it's a mass, it's a placeholder. That's the way Revit likes to show it. You can change the graphics for this if you'd like. Uh, there are ways to do it. I won't get into it now, but um, because for this purpose, I'm fine with it being a ghost building. It's Halloween, it works well. So uh, what are the next steps that we wanna do? The first thing that's really helpful to do is to add some levels in here that will be placeholders for my mass floors. Because right now, as you see, I have these levels, but I don't have any slices through the building that will be floors. So to do that, I'm gonna click on the mass and I'm gonna select mass floors on this modify mass ribbon tab. And when I do that, I get this button or this dialogue here with some options. Now I want a floor slice at say every level but level 10 because at level 10, I'm not gonna have a floor surface, I'll have a roof. Uh, so what I will do is I will click first on level one and I'll hit shift and click to level nine. And then with all of those highlighted, I can select a box next to anyone and it will select all the boxes there. Just a little quick tip for you. So with those ones selected, I'm gonna hit okay. And what Revit has done is essentially inserted, inserted a, if you will, a slice of paper at every level here that I have assigned. And that paper, if you click on it, it's just a mass floor. It doesn't have any actual volume or depth or material assigned to it. It's a placeholder. Um, and really that's what all these faces of the mass are as well. And you'll see how that works here in a little bit. So with these 
placeholders, I want to actually assign real floors to them. So to get started with that, we are going to go to the massing and site tab up here at the ribbon. Now I have to tell you, this is the easiest tutorial you'll ever see in your entire life when it comes to Revit. And that's what I love about the conceptual design environment within Revit. It makes creating buildings so much easier. So even if you're a complete Revit newbie, you're gonna learn something and be able to do some pretty incredible things after this quick webinar. So I wanna work with these floors. The first thing I'm gonna do is go to the floor button here. I'm gonna select that. And then over here on the properties, I will choose the type of floor that I want to use. Now for this, I'll use a lightweight concrete on metal deck. And when you zoom in, uh, you can see we've got all of our placeholders here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to click once on each placeholder that I want to turn into this lightweight concrete on metal deck flooring. So I will select each of those. And let's say I wanna do something different on the first floor. I won't select that one. You know what, maybe I want something different on the second floor too. So to deselect, I'll just click it. But I changed my mind. I'm gonna keep that one as well. So it's really easy. You can unclick and click and uh, select what you need. But once you have your selection exactly as you'd like it, go back up to the ribbon here where it's a modify tab and select create floor. And all of a sudden those placeholders become filled with the floor that you chose. And these floors, uh, even though we used the model, the mass model to create them, they are the same as if you drew them as a regular traditional Revit floor. You can edit the boundary, you can add sub elements to say slope to a drain, whatever you need. Uh, and the great thing with this too is that it does attach to the outside of the building. So as you see, the floors kind of shrink down the way that the building slants and they expand out toward the top. So that's excellent. It's great to use that tool. Now, I think uh, the first floor here, I did not create a floor uh, because of all of the, the different lightweight here. I want to do something unique on the first floor. So to do that, I'm going to go back up to my floor button and we'll just do generic since I don't know quite what I want to do there yet. And I'm going to select the first floor only and hit create floor. And there you go. I've got a floor right there at level one. And these floors are very similar to floors in a regular Revit project that you're designing. The top surface of the floor is going to align to the top of the level here. So anything that goes beneath that, the depth of this floor, the volume is going to go beneath that level. All right, so we've got floors. What's next? Let's do some walls. Um, again, this is so easy. So we are still here in the massing and site tab. We can use this model by face wall tool. Or if you're familiar with the architecture tab, you can click the split button under wall and select wall by face there as well. They do the same thing, but since I'm here in the massing tab, I'm gonna go ahead and use this wall button here. First of all, let's go and grab the wall type that we wanna use. So right now I've got this basic wall, but let's say I wanna do brick on metal stud. I'm gonna select that wall and I can ignore these location line base constraints for now because really I just want my wall to follow the face of the mass. But one thing I want to pay attention to here is this, with the location line, if I select finish face exterior, that means the finish face of my wall is going to attach to the finish side of this mass. And that means all of the depth of the wall is going to be cut out of the inside of my building. This is great if you have a mass that is aligned to a lot line, and so you don't want anything going outside over the mass. Uh, but if you have different constraints, just know that you can accommodate them through the location line. So again, it's easy. I've selected my wall type, and now all I have to do is just click the faces that I want to convert to that wall. So I'm gonna do these back three sides here, and I'll hit escape to end, to exit, excuse me, that command. And when I zoom in, you can see the finished face of that brick wall is aligned to the finished face of the mass. And that is exactly how I wanted it to be. And it's really exciting because again, it adopts that slanted shape in the front. But let's do something a little different with this front face that's sloped. This time, let's consider using a curtain wall. So I'm gonna click curtain system here by face. And again, I have the opportunity to change the properties. I'm gonna use edit type here because by default, these curtain systems don't 
really specify a panel and I want that to be a glazed panel. So I'm gonna hit okay, but again, you can change any of this grid spacing, the mullion types, whatever you'd like to see. And then finally, I am going to once again, click the face that I would like to change to become a curtain system and then hit create system. And easy as that, I have created a slanted curtain system. Now this is a big deal. If you're not using the latest version of Revit, slanted walls have previously been pretty much impossible. And so the only way to do them was to create a mass and then assign a wall type to that face. So if you're still using Revit, say 2019, like I am right here, this is the best way to do a slanted wall. So now that I have this, I wanna show you too that just like any other curtain system, even though we've attached it to a mask, the panels are individually editable. So if I unpin this and I wanna change it from a glazed panel and to a solid, I certainly can do that. It doesn't really matter that it came from a mask. It is now a wall and it acts like a wall. So let's work on the roof. Again, I'm here in the massing tab. I'm going to click on roof by face and easy enough, I'm gonna switch back down here to the type of roof that I'd like. I'm gonna use this EPDM. And then I'm going to, again, select multiple, select the face that I wanna do. And this time I'm gonna do this face and I'll do the top of the pumpkin. I think I want a roof there too. And with those two selected, I can click create roof. And there I have it, it's a roof, it's perfect. And I'm gonna hit escape. So the only thing left really to do here is maybe uh, add some detail into this pumpkin. I will make some walls with that. We'll do something generic. I don't know exactly what the intent is for a pumpkin on a roof, but as you see, it's pretty simple. I'm just assigning by face. If you're not sure if you've assigned one already, you can see that I still have the ghostly figure here until I put the wall in and then it becomes solid. So the best way to know if you've already been somewhere is to see if you can see through that particular area. And if you can, nothing has been assigned. So I'm gonna get inside the little eyes here. And I know this is goofy. You probably will never create a jack-o'-lantern on a building, but it's really just to show you that uh, this tool is able to adapt to really anything that you can create or imagine uh, in your building workflows. So there we have it. I assigned some materials to the floors, I've assigned roofs, I've assigned walls and a curtain wall. Um, now what do I do about this mask? You have some options here. A lot of times if you're thinking you might go back to concept, you might change a few things, you might wanna reload the mask in and play with it a little bit more in the future. You probably wanna keep it where it is, but maybe not see it all the time. So what you might wanna do is go to your visibility graphics overrides here and click edit scroll down to where mass is, I've gone too far, there we go, and uncheck it. And so then you can, and this is, the warning here is telling me that I'm gonna turn off the mass visibility, visibility in this view, but the mass can be um, available in other views as well. So that's fine. So you can turn your mass off here if you'd like. Uh, another thing that you can do, and I'm gonna undo that, is check it filter everything, filter or select only the mass. And so now that I have the mass selected, a lot of people are gonna cringe as I do this, but I can actually hit delete and nothing is going to be messed with or wrong. So if I hit delete, you see the building is still there. It's fine, it survived. The mass is just a placeholder. These building elements are there regardless of whether the mass is there or not, because now they are created in Revit, they stand alone. And as you see, I keep highlighting over this wall because this is something important to see. Um, this wall has a profile that has automatically been created to fit where the mass was. And so that's why you get these dashed lines on the side. But the important thing is, is this wall acts like any other wall. So let's go back to our architecture tab, click door, and you can see we can add doors here, any level that's a little dangerous, but we'll let it go. Um, you can add windows in just like you would in a Revit model of any kind. So as you see, if you create a concept in Revit's conceptual mass environment, the time that it takes to get from that concept figure into an actual drawing here that you can use for your DDs 
is just seconds, which takes so much time out of your process. You can put that toward other things or, hey, get your Saturday back. Um, all of this stuff, it's not just to save you from a SketchUp subscription, but to try to get a little more uh, time back in your budgets and give you a little more re room to be creative and flexible with your concepts, knowing that it doesn't take too long to get to design documents and development from that point. So that being said, I appreciate so much that you guys were here and um, enjoyed a little bit of learning how to do concepts and take them into real buildings here in Revit. I look forward to answering any of your questions. And of course, if you have questions after this, once you're working on your actual projects, if you have a concept that you're trying to work through and you get stuck, reach out to us at Cadnetics U. We're always happy to help. We can train you through uh, anything that really comes up between very first day one concept through permits, building, we're happy to help you with that. So I'm gonna send it back to Mara and answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much. So we'll give it a minute to allow questions to come in. Um, a kind of a beginner question that I wanna get out there for everyone, maybe this is their first time seeing or understanding Revit. When would you use this over just starting a design in Revit? Mm, great question. I like to use this if I want to just play around with some different configurations on a lot. So one of the things that I may have mentioned in the past, I'm gonna open up this uh, 3D concept here, is we can actually move into a plan view and create some um, reference planes. And then, so with this, you see I have this plane here, let's call this lot line. If I need to do a setback, and I know that that setback needs to be 26 feet, I can actually start to create some of those uh, setbacks like that. And so once I actually throw that building into Revit and I start assigning walls to it, I know that I'm not going to encroach and I don't have to keep checking on that. That's probably my favorite way to use um, conceptual design. But then also, I mean, it just allows you to create some fun and funky shapes that are really, really hard to execute in just a straight Revit project file. All right, perfect. I don't see any questions coming in. Um, so I will just say that if you do have any follow up questions on any of the recordings, um, previous or th this one, feel free to reach out to Gabrielle individually. Um, her email is obviously at all the um, emails sent out to you guys um, for registering. So you should have her email address and her pretty little picture there. Um, so you know who you're talking to, you have a face to a name. Uh, yes, think, I'm real. <laughs> she's real. Uh, yeah, I just suggest to reach out if you have any questions. This is, this is really her bread and butter and I think she really enjoys doing that and answering any of these questions. So I don't think that she'll mind. Um, and we obviously want to offer as much support as we can as we go through these webinars. They are short, yes, but they are really here to give you concise information in a short amount of time. Um, before we sign off here, Gabriel, do you want to explain the upcoming webinar on November 12th? Absolutely, yes. I am really, really excited about this. Um, if you have been using Revit for one day or a thousand, you really, really want to learn how to use the Pi Revit add-in. Excuse me. Um, it saves you so much time, and we have been lucky enough to uh, get the creator of Pi Revit to join us on our next webinar on November 12th to run through how to use his add-in, how to get the most out of it, and how it can really, really save you a lot of time and frustration on your Revit projects. So definitely be there. I will be there. I will be talking a whole lot less, but it's definitely worthwhile and you should really, really plan to attend. Awesome, thank you. So you can find that link in any of the um or actually the newsletter that we just sent out. So if you've registered for any webinars previous to this one, or also this one, um, you will receive a link to that, to the Pi Revit. You can also find that link directly on the Cadnetics U LinkedIn page, Facebook page, um, and the Cadnetics Facebook page as well. So feel free to join for that one. That one's really excited. We already have a good group joined up for that. I do think we have a limit of 100. So please make sure that you join fast so we don't run out of room on that one and you get to see all that you can see for that webinar. Um, other than that, we really appreciate you taking your time learning these new uh, tricks that Gabriel loves to put out here for you. We do hope that if you have any questions, you reach out and we look forward to seeing you on the next webinar on November 12th featuring that Pi Rabbit.
All right. Yes. Yeah, sounds good. See you then. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. Bye.